Okay, so welcome to this third video on motor learning in the cerebellum and how long-term depression in cerebellar Purkinje cells is really important for that and how um, that long-term depression is actually achieved uh, molecularly. Right, okay, so we've discussed how if a synaptic contact between a granule cell and a Purkinje cell is active at the time that a climbing fibre is also active, then that will uh, produce long-term depression, i.e. a weakening of this synaptic contact between the granule cell and the Purkinje cell. Now, we've looked at the mechanism by which uh, granule cells interact with Purkinje cells. They activate this IP3 pathway, basically. They activate phosphonosatide signaling pathway. Now, this pathway will have an effect on the Purkinje cell. It will uh, trigger whatever it triggers. Uh, it will trigger some sort of change in the likelihood that the, uh, the, the Purkinje cell will actually fire. However, what's important for us as far as discussing long-term depression is concerned is that the IP3 will also go and bind to this IP3 receptor. Uh, and basically, what IP3 does when it binds to the IP3 receptor is it makes available uh, calcium um, stimulatory binding sites, basically, on this IP3 receptor. So, if you get calcium coming in here now, this will activate this re IP3 receptor. Now, if the granule cell is active and actively stimulating the Purkinje cell without the climbing fiber being active, then this IP3 receptor does not open because you do not get the calcium influx that is needed to uh, also actually open this IP3 receptor. Okay, but if the granule cell is actively stimulating the Purkinje cell dendritic spine and uh, a, a climbing fiber uh, fires, then the climbing fiber is going to provide the calcium that then leads to the opening of this IP3 receptor. And when they both are there together, that's going to lead to the calcium release from the IP3 receptor, and that calcium release is going to cause long-term depression. Okay, so really the IP3 receptor acts as a coincidence detector. The stimulation of the Purkinje cell by the uh, granule cell provides the IP3, and the stimulation of the Purkinje cell by the climbing fibre provides the calcium. And together, when they're both there together, that's going to open the IP3 receptor, release the calcium, and the calcium is going to lead to long-term depression. Okay, so now what we need to look at is how exactly uh, does the climbing fibre cause calcium entry into uh, the Purkinje cell. Okay, so let's say that... Um, this is one of our dendrites of our um, Purkinje cell. And let's say this is our dendritic spine, which our uh, axon terminal of our granule cell has been synapsing. So this granule cell was active at the time that the um, climbing fiber is going to be active. So this is our granule cell axon terminal here. And we've seen that that is releasing glutamate onto the dendritic spine of the um, Purkinje cell uh, dendrite, uh, and um, that's causing IP3 to go up in here. Now let's say we have our climbing fiber coming here and also making uh, synaptic contact with our um, dendrite, but it's not making it with the usual uh, dendritic spine here, it's just synapsing straight onto the dendrite. And basically, this climbing fiber also releases glutamate, uh, but it's releasing it basically onto uh, extra synaptic sites, so it's not, um, it's not releasing it onto dendritic spines. Okay, so let's draw a bigger picture of this. So here's our uh, membrane of the um, dendritic, the dendrite rather, and here's the axon terminal here, okay, of the, um, of the climbing fiber. Right, so basically what happens is that the climbing fiber releases glutamate, so here comes our glutamate molecule again, and this time, on this membrane, on the membrane of the dendrite that isn't in dendritic spines, what you have is ionotropic glutamate receptors. So let's draw some ionotropic glutamate receptors here. So here is an AMPA receptor here, and here's an NMDA receptor here. So you have two types of uh, glutamate receptors on um, the uh, membrane of the dendrite. One is an, is an AMPA receptor here, and one is an NMDA receptor down here, so AMPA receptor and an NMDA receptor. Right, okay, so 
Um, when the uh, dendrite of the Purkinje cell is at resting membrane potential, so uh, when it's used at minus 65 millivolts across the membrane, what happens is that the NMDA receptor is blocked by a magnesium ion. So basically, there is a magnesium ion sitting in the pore of the NMDA receptor. So even if glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor and causes it to open, it doesn't open. It doesn't actually um, let any current come through it because it's blocked by that magnesium ion sitting in that NMDA receptor and blocking it. Okay. So, what happens when this um, axon terminal of this climbing fibre releases glutamate onto um, the membrane of the dendrite of the Purkinje cell? Is that glutamate, four glutamate molecules bind to this AMPA receptor, one to each of the four subunits of the AMPA receptor, and um, two glutamates bind to the NMDA receptor. Um, so I'll just go over a little reminder of the structure of NMDA and AMPA receptors. So basically, if this is an AMPA receptor, it's again made up of four subunits, basically, um, which form the pore-forming subunit of the AMPA receptor. And all four of these subunits have ligand binding domains for glutamate. So glutamate needs to bind to all four of them to open this AMPA receptor fully. Whereas the NMDA receptor, uh, again, it does have four subunits, but two of them are what are known as GluN1 subunits. So two of them, let's say these two here, are GluN1 subunits. So they are encoded by the gene GluN1. And basically, GluN1 subunits have a ligand binding domain, but it doesn't bind to glutamate. Instead, it binds to glycine or D-serine. Now, glycine is very high, well, it's not very high, but it's high enough in the extracellular fluid that these, um, these um, ligand binding domains of the GluN1 subunits, which I'll colour in blue here, these two subunits here, they, they are always basically occupied by glycine. So, in order to open the NMDA receptor, what you need to do is bind glutamate to the ligand binding domains of these two non-GluN1 subunits. So these are both non-GluN1 subunits. So they could be GluN2A, GluN2B, GluN2D, or etc. There are other subunits which do bind glutamate. GluN1 is the only subunit that doesn't bind, of the NMDA receptor that doesn't bind glutamate. So basically you only need two glutamate molecules to come in and bind to each of the ligand binding domains of the two non-GluN1 subunits to open the um, NMDA receptor. However, when you open the uh, NMDA receptor and the electrical potential difference across the membrane is at its normal level, negative 65 millivolts, you don't get any current coming through because of this magnesium block. When you open the AMPA receptor, however, you do get a current through. You get a positive depolarizing current. The AMPA receptor is permeable to both sodium and potassium cations. Now, sodium's uh, electrochemical gradient drives it in and potassium's electrochemical gradient drives it out. But the movement of sodium in is greater than the movement of potassium out, at, at least at resting membrane potential. So you overall get a positive current coming in. So you move positive charge in overall, and that depolarizes the membrane. Now, if that depo depolarization of the membrane is large enough, uh, and it usually has to get above negative 20 millivolts, then what will happen is that the magnesium ion won't um, won't feel a stronger force driving it into the intracellular compartment because magnesium is a divalent cation. The reason it's sitting in this pore is because it wants to be in the um, intracellular compartment because the intracellular compartment has a lower electrical potential than the extracellular compartment and it was lower by negative 65 millivolts. It was lower by 65 millivolts. Um, so magnesium wanted to be in the intracellular compartment. However, when you depolarize the membrane, the pull on the magnesium into the intracellular compartment becomes lower. So it starts, you know, coming out of this pore, basically, and going back into the extracellular fluid. And when it comes out of the pore of the NMDA receptor, then NMDA receptor starts conducting calcium ions. It also conducts sodium and potassium, but the main important thing is that it conducts calcium into the cell, into the cytoplasm. So now, here is your calcium. You have now got calcium coming in to uh, the cytoplasm of this dendrite. 
and basically that's going to go into the dend some of it's going to diffuse into the dendritic spine and now it goes to this IP3 receptor which is already primed IP3 is bound to the IP3 receptor because the granule cell was stimulating the IP3 receptors in that dendritic spine okay so the um, stimulatory calcium binding sites are now exposed on this IP3 receptor so if I denote these calcium ions by an orange blob Calcium is going to come and bind to each of the stimulatory calcium binding sites on this IP3 receptor, and that will cause the IP3 receptor to open. And when the IP3 receptor opens, it will allow calcium to leave the intracellular stores, and calcium levels will now go up hugely in that dendritic spine. And calcium levels going up hugely in that dendritic spine causes this synapse to weaken by mechanisms that are not understood. But basically, that is believed to be the mechanism of long-term depression. So this synaptic contact between the granule cell and uh, the dendritic spine of the Purkinje cell is going to become weaker. The ability of this granule cell to stimulate this cell is going to go down. And there are two mechanisms by which that could either happen. One is that it could happen presynaptically, i.e. the amount of glutamate that the granule cell releases could go down. So whenever the granule cell gets stimulated by its axon, the granule cell releases a certain amount of glutamate. If the amount of glutamate it released was to go down, then that would explain why the synaptic contact was weaker, because every time you stimulate it now, you'll release less glutamate, you'll stimulate less metabotropic glutamate receptors, you'll stimulate less of a response in this, um, in this uh, dendritic spine. Okay, uh, so, um, another uh, alternative is that it could act postsynaptically, uh, and it's not yet understood which of the two is true. Um, I think probably the general opinion is that both of them probably have an element of truth in them. The postsynaptic argument would be that the glutamate receptors in this uh, postsynaptic synapse would have their expression decreased, basically. So you decrease uh, the expression of glutamate receptors in this postsynaptic synapse, and that uh, would be what, um, what weakens this synapse, basically. Okay, so that completes our discussion of long-term depression in the cerebellar um, um, Pekinji cells.